Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Another great author event at the Hudson Library. We're all so happy to have you. Can I have a show of hands? How many people are here from Hudson? Okay, a lot. And how many people from outside of Hudson? About 50-50, that's great. Thank you all for making the trip. Uh, I've been trying to get Michael to come here for a few years now. A few little emails back and forth. <laughs> He's very, uh, very busy guy. But uh, we finally snagged him, and we're so happy to have him. He has a new book out, Egg, A Culinary Exploration of the World's Most Versatile Ingredient. And it goes along with the new Time Magazine cover this week. If it, any of you haven't seen it, it says, Eat Butter, so, <laughs> which I know you'd agree with. Anyway, uh, we're all, uh, I'd like to remind you that we have a donation box on the wall to make all these programs possible for you. And uh, we appreciate everything you can give. Um, without any further ado, let's welcome Cleveland's own Michael Ruhlman. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, having me here. I'm sorry it's been three years. I didn't think it was three years. Um, <clears throat> can you all hear me okay? Um, a qu quick question. Who's heard me speak before? Just curious. Okay. I never know if I'm repeating stuff. I'm always, uh, my wife says, you're repeating yourself. And, or somebody at the last event said, I heard the same thing last time. It's like, well, hi, you know, I can't keep generating all this new material. Um, but I do think my story is uh, important. And, um, and so I sort of start with my, with, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions and hopefully a conversation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the new book. Um, but I'd like to tell you about how I got here because I, I'm a complete accident. Um, I never intended to be here, um, never sought it, uh, never envisioned it. I always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to be an important writer. Um, uh, but that was uh, not to be. Um, because you know, on the way to becoming an important writer, I got uh, waylaid at the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, and it, it, changed, it changed who I was and changed who I am. And I'm going to read you a, a brief few pages on, on, on those changes. <coughs> In order to be, a, I realized very quickly that I just couldn't wa watch what it meant to be a chef. I had to change because the changes were interior. I changed. Um, I learned efficiency of movement to minimize wasted energy and time, and the idea of efficiency of movement extended to intellectual work. I began to value speed above m speed. <coughs> I began to value speed of movement more than ever. Also, precision of movement. Speed without precision is harmful, especially when knives and hot steel and scalding oil are involved. I learned mental flexibility. You can accomplish anything, anything at all, if you set your mind to it. One must adopt a can-do-anything attitude. You were a professional. You didn't say no, not ever. You didn't complain. You didn't get tired. And you showed up no matter what. You got there. Nothing but nothing kept you from reaching that kitchen. Also, you accepted the implicit obligation of excellence. Every effort would be your absolute best. Otherwise, it was simply not worth doing. At the same time, you accepted that your best was never your best and never could be because you could always work faster, cleaner, more efficiently. Many of the internal changes a formal culinary education wrought were in one's attitude, a kind of tougher-than-thou stance. I'm tougher than you, faster than you, better than you. I'm a chef. I work in inhuman temperatures, and I like it that way. I don't have to sleep every day. If there's work to be done now, you get the work done. Only got a couple hours sleep last night, and you've got 18 more hours of work ahead of you? Good. You like that. You're a chef. You can sleep later. Some people denigrated that this attitude as false machismo in a profession famously abusive to women. I bought into it, wore that mantle, because the work was hard, and you had to think like that to get the work done. That's all there was to it. Tom Griffiths, one of my instructors at the CIA, told me about his first job, Poisson Poissonnier at Le Cirque in Manhattan. He butchered fish all day long, six days a week. The work left him so exhausted, demoralized, and depleted that he returned to his apartment every night and wept. On his day off, he lay flat, hoping just to recover. Working in kitchens can be hard. Whatever tools you could forge in your mind and soul to get the work done you were glad for, you changed. And you couldn't turn this stuff off. 
You weren't just like this when you went to work. You were like this every waking second. You were like this in your dreams. It was who you were. You were a chef. Your work as a chef extended to all areas of your life. Dan Turgeon, another CIA instructor, told our class about his first job, a line cook for Jeffrey Boobin at Vidalia in DC, a turning point in his career. One night, mid-service, Boobin kicked Turgeon off the line because he wasn't fast enough. Turgeon was taken out of the game. Off the line, you're not good enough. But he wasn't fired. Turgeon had one more chance, and the next day, something clicked in. A new gear engaged, and Turgeon hustled. From that day on, Turgeon told our class, I ran everywhere I went. In his restaurants, he put that kind of pressure on you. His was the last class in the CIA curriculum, the American Bounty Restaurant, and I spent every day in a kind of controlled panic. There was no way I could get everything done, and that's what he wanted you to feel because, <coughs> because he, like most chefs at the CIA, wanted to remind you that you could never be fast enough and you could never be good enough. You, could, you, you had to hustle all the time. You couldn't stop. A couple days, I took five minutes to bolt a quick lunch, but the main thing I felt all day long was fear that I was not going to be ready at service. Then I left the CIA and returned home and began to write about learning to cook at the Culinary Institute of America. I had four months to write the book because we were going to be broke. Uh, my wife told me this. <laughs> Before my cul culinary education, I wouldn't have thought you could write a book in four months. I couldn't anyway. But I didn't think that way anymore because I had changed. If I had four months to write a book, that book would be written in four months. I remember this exchange between a chef and his bachelor's class in the CIA's four-year degree program. Chef, how long does it take to make a rice pilaf? Class, 20 minutes. Chef, how long does it take to make a rice pilaf if service is in 16 minutes? Class, 16 minutes. <laughs> you got it done, no matter what. Write a book in four months, you bet. Not getting enough sleep, too bad, sleep later. Can't come up with the words, writer's block, too bad. Come up with the words now, come up with double what you need. Other obligations pressing in, family say, meet those obligations in full and still get your work done. You like it this way, you're a chef. One afternoon in the grocery store, the checkout girl said to me, why are you always in a hurry? From her cash register, she could see me running through the parking lot every single day I came to the groceries to get groceries and then running back out, bags in hand. And I told her I could get more done that way. It was true. While I wrote the book, I ran everywhere I went. Life in a kitchen, life period was a race. You against the clock, every day, every year. Whoever does the most, the best wins, period. So what happened to your head at the CIA, or what happened to my head, translated from the chef, from the kitchen to the desk, I was using the attitude taught young chefs to get my book written. And I grew to believe that the method of methods and standards of kitchen work would translate well into a lot of other professions. But people who weren't chefs, construction workers, financial consultants, social workers, even some chefs, didn't understand the true demands of the kitchen, of kitchen work, and so didn't have the same ideas about efficiency, speed, hustle, getting things done, perfect work, and so didn't understand chefs. When such people encounter chefs, they call them crazy, temperamental. Chefs don't understand them either. Construction on a new restaurant kitchen not done? What do you mean not done? The chef asks. The ovens aren't installed, says the construction head. The floor is not in. The wires in, wiring's not hooked up. Parts didn't come in. Sorry, you'll have to wait. A chef cannot fathom this. What? Would one of his line cooks at 5.30 say, sorry, chef, not ready for service? Or when the chef called fire a lamb shank, would the cook ever dream of saying, sorry chef, didn't get around to braising the shank today, I'll try to get to them tomorrow? Of course not. You would either get some shanks now, or if you really screwed up so badly that you had no shanks already cooked, you might just fire yourself on the spot. Chefs I found really were different. They worked hard, often in incredibly hot places with no daylight for long stretches. It could make anyone a little zooey. Not long after I finished the book, I got a line cook job at a French Mediterranean restaurant that could get fairly busy. During the year before I came, two line cooks at different times left the line in the middle of service saying they had to go to the bathroom and never returned. <laughs> this is firing yourself, but it won't make you a lot of friends on a Saturday night. 
I worked grill station over both a stove and a wood-burning grill. I had to keep that grill really hot or the fish would stick on me and make my life miserable. I left a thermometer out of my station. It hit 150 degrees during service, which lasted on Saturday from 5.30 to 11. On most Saturdays, you hit the ground running, and you don't stop moving until close. You're not just standing there bearing the heat for five and a half hours after spending all day prepping your station. You're moving like an athlete. This is your court, your field. You're focused, you're thinking hard, you're organized. You have a dozen different dinners going on every second, and they're going out that door, and they've got to be perfect. They've got to look beautiful, and that plate has got to be clean. 150 degrees. Let me tell you, that's hot. You can cook yourself that way. And I think some chefs really do cook themselves. Their brains get a little too hot, and they get a little whacked. <laughs> so that's what happened to me. Um, I changed. Um, uh, and I, I'm still that way today. And uh, um, so. One, that means that my wife thinks I'm an asshole in the kitchen, basically. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what happened is after I finished that book, um, four months later, we were broke again. Uh, I couldn't get another book going, and I, uh, and I, I couldn't, I, nothing, nothing was happening. I couldn't get enough freelance work done. I knew I wanted to keep writing about this work, so I said, I've got this free education that I have from writing this, from writing and reporting and writing this book. I can become a cook. I'm going to become a cook. And so, um, broke, unemployed writer living in Cleveland goes even farther out into the sticks into Bainbridge, Ohio, um, because he's heard that a woman named Susie Heller, who runs a restaurant there, is really well connected with chefs. And I figure she'll know who I can work for in Cleveland, who's the best chef. I knew that you had to work with the best chefs who want to learn the most. Um, and she could, um, she could maybe get me a job. So uh, I went out there. Again, I published nothing nationally on food, completely unknown, um, all but broke, baby daughter, angry wife. Um, and uh, I said, Susie, this is what I'm doing. I'm hoping you can get me a job as a cook. We really needed it. I, we had no health insurance, et cetera. It was a, it was a dark time. Um, and so I walked out. So she looked at my stuff. We sat down in this booth. She was really sweet. And she looked at my, my writing. She saw that I'd written another book before on, um, on, on, a, on boys' education. She said, wow, I didn't know you were doing this. I'm working with Thomas Keller at the French Laundry, and we're, we're looking for a writer for his cookbook. <laughs> um, long story short, um, I, I basically left there with um, tickets to the French Laundry two weeks later to go out there and have dinner with then the most enigmatic um, chef in the country, every, it's where every chef wanted to go. The first time I heard his name was from Michael Simon. I was interviewing him back when he was before Lola. I said, if you had to go one, if you could go one place uh, to work, to train under, where would you go? He said, I'd go to the French Laundry and work for Thomas Keller. So among chefs, he had this cachet already, um, this, this importance. Uh, and, and here, this broke Clevelander um, with no culinary bylines in the national press is being sent out to the, the best restaurant in the country, maybe the world, to write the best chef's cookbook. Um, I wanted to be a novelist, an important writer, but I have to believe God said, I don't care what you want. You're good at this, and this is what you're going to do. Um, I don't know any other explanation for it. It's just too outlandish. So I've always thought, thought there was a, a, an element of, um, an element of uh, divine intervention uh, in my career, uh, having done that. And for a while, I was kind of I, I worried about that it wasn't really important that you know writing about food and cooking is this what we should spend our lives, what I should spend my life doing, what I should devote myself to? Um, and I did worry: should I, you know, should I be a real, you know, a real journalist? Should I be over in Afghanistan? Um, should I be reporting on uh, more urgent uh, matters? But as the years have gone on, we've we've increasingly uh, grown. Uh, we've increasingly grown to understand uh, that, that, that food is important. <laughs> food is really important. Um, a lot of people ask me, why this interest in chefs? You know, why this interest in the Food Network? What's going on here? I honestly believe that it's because when something you need to survive starts making you sick, you become very obsessive about it. 
you didn't have any air to breathe right now, you'd be very obsessive about air. Um, the problem is we have food all around us. We have cheap food available to us 24-7, most of us anyway. Um, so how, 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 you know, so we didn't recognize that this was the problem, that this was the reason for our obsession. But if we look at our nation, uh, we know well, we know well that our nation is, is sick, that, that it's cost of diabetes alone is costing us billions of dollars, uh, uh, if not a half a trillion dollars a year. Um, again, ob the obesity epidemic, kids getting adult diseases, um, allergies that we've never seen before, food obsessions, uh, this obsession with gluten-free, uh, when, when half the people don't even know what gluten is or why it you know, might be bad for you, um, which I ranted about on my, on my site today. Um, we were taught that, um, you know, that, that fat was bad for us. Fat was bad. Um, it turns out that was wrong. Fat is not bad. Fat is good. Um, fat is not bad. Stupid is bad. And, and that's what we've been doing. We've been that way. We have not thought for ourselves. Now, in this week's cover of Time, it's eat butter. Fat's not bad. It's looking more and more like, and don't listen. I, I ask you, don't listen to me. Do not listen to me or anything that I'm saying here tonight. I want you to think for yourselves. Um, but the evidence does seem to show more and more that the, 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 dangers, the dangerous stuff we've been eating has been refined sugars and refined carbohydrates. That's, that is likely the culprit. Um, that's my opinion. No one knows anything for sure. No one knows anything for sure because there's been no studies done. No randomized clinical studies have been done on any of this. It's all been supposition. Um, I, I truly believe, I, I've come to believe this now, and, and now I'm very glad to be writing about food and cooking and the chefs because the chefs are helping us show the way to, to a better world, a better life. I, tr I honestly believe that the world is better if we cook our own food. That's all we need to do. There's a great, there's a cynical uh, mar marketer that Michael Pollan was interviewing for the New York Times Magazine story, cover story called America Doesn't Cook Anymore. And the, and the marketer guy, Harry Balzer was his name, says, um, you know, Michael Pollan says, like, can't you give me any good news? He says, no, Americans are stupid and lazy. They're never gonna change. Um, and say, so, well, can you give me some, like, just diet advice for them or something? He said, here, I'll give you a diet. Cook your own food. <laughs> Eat anything you want. Just cook it yourself. And there's a lot of logic to it. So much logic that Michael Pollan wrote a, a book recently called Cook, about the importance of cooking. When we cook our own food, we're all but guaranteed um, <laughs> a balanced diet, a delicious diet, a house that smells good, which has, which has unacknowledged consequences. When we cook our own food, our bodies are healthier, our families are healthier, our communities are healthier, and our environment is healthier. Uh, when we're cooking whole natural foods, we're not relying on the industrial giants who are processing our food, who do not have our best interests, surprise, at heart. Uh, they are, they're f making food for the bottom line. Um, and you can't listen to them. It's really important. People say, I'm too busy to cook. I ask them, are you too busy to shower? You know, you just don't hear that. <laughs> I'd love to shower, I just, I just can't find the time. <laughs> um, we, we, we shower and bathe because it's important. We make time for it. Yes, cooking can take a little more time, but you've, we, we, we live in families and communities. Let's share the work. Uh, let's make our own food. The smell of food cooking in the house is proven to re relax us. It affects our limbic system and our parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and it, 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 it eases our stress. The fast food companies and the uh, processed food companies and the people who give you box food that you can cook in three minutes in your microwave, they're saying, we're gonna make your life easier, better, and less stressful. Is it less stressful? We've been eating their food for decades now. No, it's more stressful. We're sicker. Uh, our environment is, is sick. We're, we're polluting the land that grows our food. We're polluting the water with nitrogen runoff. We're creating dead zones in the ocean, so depleted of oxygen, nothing can live in them. We're overfishing the oceans. Um, we're, de we're debasing the animals we eat for food, and we're debasing the workers who, who process those animals. Um, 
the way we grow, distribute, and consume food shapes the country in ways we never realized before, and we're just waking up to that now. So that is why I think it is important that I write about food. That's why it's important to me. And that's why I write books about cooking, because I want to encourage more people to cook. We're taught by these food companies that we're too stupid to cook. We're too, you know, it's too hard. Cooking is too hard. Let us do it for you. Um, so I was at a conference, uh, a food writer symposium at the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia, sitting with a book editor from Chronicle Books, a guy named Bill LeBlanc, and we were having a, 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 a we were having a mint julep after the day's seminar. It was a really delightful, lovely spring evening. And he was just lamenting. He's like, you know, Michael, I, I, my cooking doesn't get it. It doesn't get, I can't get any better. And I said, Bill, there's only like, there's only like 20 things you need to know in order to cook everything. And he looked at me and said, that's a book. <laughs> um, so, wait. Um, but I thought, well, God, you know, it's, it's more than five. And it's, it's not a thousand, not even a hundred. So I thought twenty is probably right, and so I set about writing a book. I write books because I don't know uh, something because I want to find something out. I don't know something and then go write a book about it. I go, I go and enter a subject that I know nothing about and go to write it. So I wanted to figure out what are the twenty things that you need to know in order to cooking, and that's how the book Romans Twenty came about. And so I came up with um, I think seven foods, food stuffs that are that you use as tools, um, and then techniques. Um, grill, saute, poach. One of those food tools, along with salt, the most important ingredient, and another thing we've been taught is bad for us, salt. If you salt your own food, it's not bad for you. If you don't have pre-existing conditions, not bad for you. It's bad for you because we it's in all this canned soups, it's in all the box goods that we eat. Um, you know, again, if you eat a healthy, natural diet, you can season your food um, to, to, to levels that are comfortable. If you don't have any salt, you die. Not having salt is an issue. Having salt uh, is not. Again, it's another thing that we've been taught that's being rethought. Don't listen to me. When I got to the egg, the egg is one of Romans 20. When I got to the egg, um, each, 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 each technique has five representative examples. When I got to the egg, I thought, <laughs> well, wh you know, like, we're, where do you even begin? I, my, my, as soon as I started thinking about all the ways the, to use an egg, I, I, just, I, I just didn't know where it had been at. So, so I thought, okay, um, let's think about this logically. You know, I felt like a real idiot. And I thought, okay, you can use it in its shell, take it out of its shell. You use it in its shell, you can cook it hard, medium, soft, sous vide. You take it out of its shell, you can bake it, you can fry it, you can poach it, uh, you can deep fry it. Or you can blend it, and then you can do all these stuff, and then you can separate it. And suddenly, in the landscape of my mind, all these explosions were going off, all the things you could do with an egg. Um, and I, got, I called Don. I said, Don, you've got to get into the, into the kitchen um, uh, or into the dining room. You've got, you got to write this down. So I got out this scroll of a parchment paper. I said, draw a big egg at the top. And I said, okay, egg. And so I went in, sh in shell, out of shell. Um, out of shell, whole. Out of shell, separated. Um, and so we finally had virtually all the ways you could use an egg, and I had a five-foot-long scroll of parchment paper um, with, with all the things um, you could do with an egg and a representative recipe of each one, um, and that became my book proposal to Little Brown, uh, a five-foot scroll of paper. Does anybody have the book, by the way, the egg book? Could you look in the back, or could somebody just pull out the folder? of economy. I mean, th there's nothing that's not better with an egg on it. Um, this, <laughs> nothing. Name something. I, I can't think of one thing. Um, the egg does so many things. But if, what I realized is if we knew all that we can do with an egg, such as thicken a sauce and enrich a sauce like a Blanquette de Veau, 
we would be able to, or make a bread, um, we would, and we would uh, egg wash is, a, is another way to use it. Um, this is Chanmushia custard. These are photographs by my, Donna, uh, my wife, Donna. She is wonderful. She's no longer mad at me. Um, <laughs> macaroons, those were Clover Club cocktails. The, the egg white uh, gives it body. This is how your eggs should look. And you need a metallic lid or the most important part for keeping a good uh, custard egg is to uh, put in the egg white and that's it. Otherwise you get that dry sulfuric um, uh, bad tasting part of it. This is a curried egg salad and a papadam. Uh, there's a deep fried egg. I love it. Love it, love it in deep fry oil. You can put a little caramel there and it'll, and it'll come out. Because the egg white is composed of uh, various proteins. Some of them are really thin. So I created this spoon called the, uh, called the Badass AKA Egg Spoon. Um, or the Badass Perforated AKA Egg Spoon. Because it's a really deep perforated uh, spoon and you just put an egg in it and would fall out, leaving just a really viscous white, and then you could poke it in. You have this beautiful pesto. Um, it, 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 another thing that I love is they're, they're just naturally beautiful. They're in beautiful shape. All the stuff of life, all the stuff needed to create life is in these shells, and we're told they were God's shells. There's the original chart, and it was various uh, bone marrow case pictures of it because it's like going through different layers. And eggnog. There's another egg on top of it, and you can actually take um, an egg in tomato sauce. This one I, I made up in Mexico, and I compared it to a, a variety of that that's taken in uh, in sauce. That uh, is an egg yolk. That's a high cooked egg. <laughs> and then on uh, uh, another here's the egg shell. Then I just sort of swirl around in, in flakes. Uh, egg whites. Egg whites have been this really miraculous thing for me. Um, they have You can top a pie with it. Um, you, can, you can make marshmallows with the meringue. You can take meringue to create an island. Um, you can turn that meringue into nougat. Uh, there's so many things you can do with meringue. There's the shelf of life. Again, beautiful economy, nutrition, viciousness, and usefulness in the kitchen that you have to avoid. And then there's onions. There's a lot of onions. <laughs> um, but I just want to show you some of the delicious That's an eight month old great Dane from a little shell, this basic egg shell. It's just so good and so easy. Um, this is a sushi raw, the white you need to bind a, a, a sushi roast meat. Uh, that's nougat, and it's candy that's stuck with nuts and uh, dried fruit. Um, that's a meringue yolk. Palm is one of my favorite things to eat. And it's so good. You make pasta with eggs. Uh, guess what? Guess cake, by the way. It's all in there. That's what cake is. Egg, sugar, flour, and just cake. And I test it very easy to make, um, but you could pop it to a heart. There's that perfect cake shell. You can see the shape of it. Um, it's just a beautiful roll. This is it. Easy. And it should be stiff, but it's not like that. It's just one of those things that it should be just the left foot to, to transport all the texture of that egg. <laughs> this is a sous vide egg. Any yolk, and it's done, it's a garnish, and yolk inside a pasta. Um, it's a great to take it. You make, make ingredients with all kinds of um, egg based uh, eggs. And that's good. I do have how, how hard is it to, to put eggs um, and to stir it and to spoon it and roll it into the cinnamon and lemon to get them loose? It can, you know, you can take a shower in that time and be really efficient. <laughs> bread in it and you bake the bread together. And so here are some of the things that you can do with an egg and why I was not so fascinated with the egg and wanted to explore the egg. Um, but ultimately for me the, the egg is sort of a symbol of how we you know how we're so easily duped. Uh, and because we don't think for ourselves. 
Um, again, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to your body. I want you to, the only thing I want you to do is cook. And cooking, we know, uh, uh, makes us healthier. Now, we stopped cooking when our country got sick. Um, we're slowly getting that back. We're starting to cook. You guys are here, I think, because you, because you care about food and you care about cooking. Uh, and I think that's really great. Uh, and it's really important. And I really think that uh, the future and prosperity of this country depends on it, um, especially if we support our local farmers um, and eat the natural foods that they're growing here in this very fertile part of Ohio. Um, you've got a great grocery store here in Hudson, Heinen's. They do when, when it's March and there's not a whole hell of a lot growing locally. Um, they, they, they source really good stuff. Um, so use good grocery stores. Um, know where your food comes from. If the, if, the, if the butcher doesn't know where the meat's coming from, maybe you don't want to use his meat because uh, maybe he doesn't really care. You want somebody who cares about their food. Um, that's part of paying attention. That's part of being a good food consumer, uh, part of being a good cook. Chefs do it. They want to know what their purveyors are. I think all of us need to behave more like chefs and know where our food comes from and source better food uh, and pay attention and commit more time to cooking. And if you don't like to cook, that's fine. If everybody in the household wanted to cook, it would be a nightmare. Um, but, but somebody in your clan needs to do the cooking. Um, and that's really all I have to say other than to thank you for being here. And I'd like to answer questions and have a conversation with for those of you who have anything to offer or questions of me, uh, whether it's working with chefs or writing or food and cooking questions. I have a question right there. Why not? <laughs> it's been out since April. <laughs> I'm ki I was ki I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, fair enough. God bless the teachers. But you're, you, so you wanted to say. Well, to f congratulations, good for you. Yeah, uh, it, cooking is a, gr is a great tool. I, I, the way we're really gonna change the, the, the food environment in this country is by teaching our kids to cook. They're the people who are gonna change it. Um, and we don't want their world to be fucked up because we were too stupid to realize it. Um, Ratios, learning ratios, basic ratios is how you can learn to cook. I wrote a book called Ratio. Um, that's a great for teaching math and proportions. So there's all kinds of lessons to be learned uh, from the egg and from food and cooking. Yes, ma'am. A mullet egg or a mole egg in France, a French term for a yolk, um, not um, fully cooked inside. It, I think I can't find the, I won't be able to find the pictures. I can find it hopefully quickly. Uh, nope, not that one. But it's, it's where the yolk is left still sort of um, creamy and, but not quite liquidy, but. Uh, um, but neither solid nor liquid. That's a mole egg, and it's just sort of like an undercooked hard-boiled egg. But they're really tasty. It gives you a different, it gives you a different flavor um, from the yolk. That's another thing I love about the egg. One of my favorite ways to eat an egg, what? You're giving me a skeptical look. No, no, the woman in black behind you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, is a broken, is a broken yolk, uh, fried egg sandwich, uh, sauteed gently in butter. 
That's one of the techniques. And you get flavors and textures that you don't get any other way because the yolk is cooked at different levels of doneness. And the different levels of doneness will give you different flavors. Um, they're, they're, these are mullet eggs. There we go. You can see how they're, they're you can almost spoon out, you know, you could don't even s almost spoon out the center. That's a mole egg. Yes, ma'am. A good question, yes. We get this, this is another, another sort of uh, symbol for me. Yes, raw eggs are fine. Eat them. Eat them. I eat them all the time. I've never gotten sick from eating a raw egg. We're taught to fear our food. Um, don't. Yeah, if, if uh, there is some danger of salmonella, it is there. It can get into the ovaries of chickens, and it can deliver the salmonella to a yolk. Um, odds, are, this is, the odds are very slim that you're not going to do it. You're going to have so much more pleasure uh, enjoying, say, a um, No, there we go. Um, you know, a raw egg on steak tartare is a great garnish. Put a raw egg yolk on a hamburger or a sandwich is great. Yolks are like, a, the, they're already a sauce consistency. Um, and they're, al they're already these really rich and delicious things. So don't be afraid of your food. I put whites, raw whites in a cocktail, make a raw white meringue to put on top of, uh, of, um, of eggnog. Um, so if you're concerned about it, buy organic eggs. Um, they're less likely to have anything, you know, th the bad ones are the super, the super factory eggs, the really, really cheap eggs. Those are the, those, if any eggs are going to have salmonella, those are, those are the ones going to do it. So if I'm going to serve raw eggs, I usually, I usually fork over the 12 extra cents per egg and <laughs> buy organic. You know, and we complain about the, the price of eggs, but basically for this miracle in a shell, um, I would pay a dollar a piece for a great egg. You had a question. Mm -hmm, my book house. I, I am still in that house, and my wife has yet to leave me. <laughs> yeah, we still love that house. I'm never leaving that house. Yes, ma'am. Um, I get them from a variety of sources. In the summer, we've got a great farmer's market, um, a, a, a couple of them. We've got many, actually. Th that's another great thing that's happening in our country is these farmer's markets that are available to us uh, selling. I urge you also to buy humanely raised meat and... and, and I'll get them from the grocery store when I need them. Um, if I'm making a ton, if I'm doing a ton of recipe testing, I will buy the cheaper eggs because I'm a cheapskate. Um, but if I'm if I want really good eggs, I'll buy organic, or I'll look for if you're if you're concerned about the chicken, and you know a lot of chickens are raised in really awful conditions. Look for certified humane. Uh, that label guarantees that the chickens are in a farm where they're treated well. Pasture raised or cage free. Look for those labels. They do mean something. Um, and we do know to a nutritionist at the, the Cleveland Clinic um, who said, yes, there have been studies and it's been proven that pasture-raised chickens, chickens on live pasture where they're free to eat bugs and, and root around and live according to their nature, the eggs are probably um, more healthy for you. Higher in omega-3 fatty acids, more nutritious generally. Um, and you can see it. You can see it in the thickness of their shell and the, and the depth of yellow. So they are, so, so yeah, buy good eggs. And if you have neighbors uh, who have chickens, befriend them. <laughs> yes, sir. Do I have a similar view on raw milk? Um, that's a trickier question. I think that people, th uh, there's a story in the New York Times today, I don't know if you saw it, about a farmer in, um, Blue Hill, Maine, who is not being allowed to sell his milk because the government has said you're not able to do it in ways to guarantee it, the, the um, Our government rules say milk has to be pasteurized, that is heated to a certain level to kill off any pathogens that may be in the milk. It also kills flavor, it also kills nutrients. 
Some people want the options to, uh, to drink raw milk. Um, I, I love to drink raw milk, and uh, if you know the farmer and you trust that they're doing it in sanitary conditions, I think it's great. I was urged not to make cheese from it because there, you know, because there is small. I don't know. People get so worried about everything. I d we've been drinking raw milk for ten thousand years. Okay. Um, I think I think we can I think we can drink it safely still today if it's done made by a farmer who cares about their animal and works on a clean farm. So, yes, ma'am. Hartzler's dairy. I have milk and fabulous. Love it. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. <laughs> um, I, I, a lot of exercise. Um, and frankly, um, I, I just, I, eat, I, I don't eat a lot. Um, I eat really good food, and when you eat really good food, um, and you have a certain genetic makeup, um, you're going to hit a natural weight, and mine's, I'm still 20 pounds overweight. I just happen to be lucky because I have a narrow face, um, um, so I'm, I'm fatter. I'm much fatter. <laughs> um, but again, I eat good food, and when you eat good food, you can't eat too much of it. I mean, I've, I've cut back a lot on pasta and breads because that, that converts too quickly to sugar, I think, and, 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 and it contributes more to actual weight gain. So. I, instead of instead of we were once told the good foods have you know that's the bottom of those grains, it's not those should be really be more as special occasions. So pasta is a special occasion for me now, and I love pasta, and I love it more now that it's a special occasion. And I'm more likely to make pasta myself because uh, that's when it's really good, and I can really appreciate it, and I put some work into it, uh, so I so I care about it, and I I feel justified. In, in using these uh, refined grains. Yes, you. What recollections do I? Oh, revelations. I uh, honestly, they are too uh, too many to mention. Revelations working with Thomas Keller. Um, the first the first revelation was the very first day I got there. I was in the kitchen. We had dinner the first night. I flew out there. We had dinner at the French Laundry. Actually, I mean, just I lost my virginity to the French Laundry, basically. <laughs> uh, so the next day, I was there, basically being interviewed by the chef, see if I was going to be the right guy to work on this book. And I was watching him seam out tuna, which means remove the membrane between the, the layers of muscle. And I said, chef, why are you seaming out that tuna? I'm standing behind him. He scrapes some of the tuna. Midwestern boy, and it was 1996, and I didn't eat a lot of fish, and I didn't like raw fish. Um, uh, but he takes his, scrapes his knife, holds this raw tuna membrane, it's dripping like saliva off his knife, and says, "Eat it." I said, "Ah, okay." <laughs> and he says, e "Eat it." I said, "I, I, I really didn't want to eat this." I said, "I understand. I understand, chef. Eat it." <laughs> and so I took it, and I ate it. And now I knew why he was removing it from the food. <laughs> I got my first lesson in refining food uh, at the French Laundry. Uh, most of all, the biggest thing that Tom, you know, he taught me just how to make, you know, just how to think, how, how, how to use your common sense. You know, we cook with all our senses. One of them is common. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's the one we, we, most, we most lack or seem to lack in the kitchen. When you're boiling, when your recipe calls for you to bring a pot of milk to a boil, and it boils over, it doesn't mean you have a mess on the stove. It means you don't have enough milk in your pot anymore. You have to think about things like that. Thomas taught me to be aware. He taught me to be aware in the kitchen. He taught me, um, I'm going to tell you one last story, and then, um, then we're going to uh, wrap it up here. Um, when Thomas was a young cook in, at the French, uh, at, at La Rive in the Hudson Valley, sort of cooked as like this little farm restaurant, French restaurant, um, and he got to cook with a lot of stuff, teach himself a lot. He's completely self-taught. Taught himself how to work with offal, because he had offal there. Um, how, you know, how to cook tripe, how to cook sweetbreads. Um, and he thought, God, you know, I'm cooking rabbits all the time. If I, I ought to know how to break them down. And he said to his rabbit provider, 
um, next time uh, you bring me the rabbits, bring them to me alive. He figured if he was a chef, he ought to know how to, how to break down a rabbit. So the guy shows up the next week with 12 rabbits. Um, he shows time to uh, kill the rabbit, put it into the board, skin it, gut it, um, uh, and, and then he left. And then there was Thomas in the backyard uh, with cute little bunnies. You know, and bunnies are really cute. They've got those, you know, cute ears and there's little noses wiggling and they've got, you know, yearning eyes. And um, he steeled himself up and he, he went for the first one. And, and he, what he said to me, he said, I don't know if you know this, Michael, but rabbits scream. <laughs> and this one screamed really loud. And it struggled to get away and struggled and struggled and eventually its legs snapped, uh, broke. And so while it still struggled, it couldn't run away. Uh, and Thomas managed to kill it. And then he had 10 cute little bunnies uh, in, in the backyard. And the, the experience was so awful for him. It was, it was, it was so draining and, and horrible that he, made, he, he was going to be damn sure these rabbits went to the best possible use as possible. It's so easy as cooks to, to forget about something in the oven and overcook it and then throw it away and start again. This could not happen with something that was so hard to kill, uh, that was such a struggle to do, that gave its life for him. He took its, he took its life. He's going to make damn sure he braises these rabbits perfectly. It showed him about waste. It taught him about life. It showed him that, that, it's, that our, fo our food is all about uh, a life and, and, and about waste. We can't waste our food. Um, uh, we can't, even with croutons, if you burn croutons in the oven, you're not wasting the life of the wheat, but you're wasting the life of the farmer that grew the wheat and the baker who baked the bread and whatever prep cook cut the croutons for you. Um, so he, he taught that was the kind of awareness that he brought. He, he took a single idea and, and applied it to, to all the, the, the rest of the spheres of his, of his life. He, I asked him, you know, where does this perfection come from, this drive for perfection that you work so hard? He says, well, you know, I think it all goes back to, you know, w to my mother. You know, when we had the house, and my job was to clean the bathroom. And it, there was a certain way to do it, and it had to shine. She ran restaurants, by the way. It had to shine. And he thought, and so that her standard became my standard. And he, and he looked at me and he said, wow, you know, pretty much everything I am and everything I do kind of goes back to cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> and that's how he became a great chef. He started out trying to please his mom and make the bathroom perfect, and he translated that to the rest of his life. Thank you very much. the rotunda and that's where the book signing will be so we'll meet you out there this way. I apologize for the mics. We just had somebody working on them too. So here, this way. Is there like a cable that you need there? Pardon me? There's a cable that you need? Oh yeah. Can you hold it please and I'll hook it up and then I'll do it. Yeah. And so you know what? She because the book was expensive, I don't think she Yeah, I have um, book plates so they can pre-sale them and you can sign the plates. Boo.